Hello and welcome to episode 69 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is November 25th, and together with Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hello. So sizing an SAP landscape can be quite complicated. I mean, Azure gives you a lot of flexibility to resize it later, but obviously customers want to know what to expect when they migrate their SAP landscape to Azure. Um, with the help of an SAP Early Watch report, um, we always have a good starting point, but there are still a lot of things that you need to consider to, to come to a good estimation. So today in our episode, we have um, John Stremme, um, joining us, who put in uh, to put together who put together a really nice document um, for for the fields for for customers and partners that guides you through um, some of these best practices how you can actually um, size um, a landscape. He will also show us um, a nice calculator to get started. But before we hand over to Trond, as uh -huh. always, let's quickly take a look at some of the news from this week. And I want to start with something that might already be old news. Um, I mean, TechEd is over. Um, SAP TechEd 2021 is um, is over. We, we had quickly talked about this um, last time, but there was also actually a nice um, blog post from, from the Microsoft side, um, which was just released, I think, after we recorded our session um, last week. So we didn't have time to talk about that. Um, but Hiren um, wrote a nice summary of some of the things that we also announced during the um, during the SAP TechEd timeframe, so uh, uh, the SAP deployment framework. We actually talked about Azure, uh, Azure files and NFS support um, there. Um, there. There's some news about um, Azure backup um, for HANA, um, some enhancements with Azure monitoring, will, which we'll also take a look at uh, in a second. And also something that is um, really interesting, the Azure Sentinel threat monitoring solution for SAP. We, we already had, talk, had talked about that um, before, but um, uh, now there there are some new updates um, when it when it comes to this. So um, here in um, yeah summarized all this. There is a nice um, um, yeah condensed version of all these announcements. Um, but actually, most or all of these things also have um, separated um, dedicated blog posts. And to start with, um, we we have now released the SAP deployment automation framework on Azure. So remember we had. Um, uh, Timo and, and, and Morgan also on, on a show um, sometime back where um, we talked about the deployment um, automation framework. Um, now in this um, docs article, it's very well explained how this whole thing worked with the two um, components um, of the deployment the in infrastructure or the, the deployment infrastructure, and then also doing the, the SAP infrastructure deployment. So it's a really nice um, document that, that really outlines this, the steps um, that are required to get started with the deployment automation framework and then deploy your SAP system. Um, then the next thing, uh, SAP, uh, sorry, uh, Microsoft Sentinel um, um, has now this um, integration in SAP. Um, again, we, we had talked about this um, sometime um, back and uh, we have now, or the, the, the colleagues have um, continued the integration, how you can actually connect um, to the SAP system. There, there are a lot of things um, still being worked on and enhanced, but I think just the um, possibilities to connect um, Sentinel now, not only to, to native Azure um, data sources, but to really be able to connect um, also to an SAP um, system and get the, the insights there. I think that is something that is, um, yeah, ex extremely helpful. And I think this, this will definitely be uh, something that we see more and more with our customers. Um, moving on, um, uh, Goran, you also brought this up um, for AMS, for the Azure monitoring for, uh, solution right. for SAP. So this is, as you mentioned already, was in Hirin's blog uh, mentioned a bit, but basically he's in more detail, said what what is be, what, what is enhanced, you know, and I mean all the SAP basis guys, exactly. They will be very familiar with those transactions, you know, about, <laughs> about uh, information about outbounding uh, RFQs, you know, inbounding uh, object locks. SN12, very always useful, you know, something something is locks, fail updates, you know, system log, SN21, that's the basically system logs uh, the, the, of, of the ABAP bad job stuff. So really a, a lot of, uh, 
very useful stuff. Uh, similar like Sentinel, what I like is always, you know, you in integrate those information in the SaaS software, so to say, meaning you do not need to install management or monitoring software, so to say, you just use it, right? Or you connect mm -hmm. it and you just use it. There is no management there. And this is something which is really, really nice with, with the with with the cloud software. No, no installation, operational or manual, just use it, right? But he, here are exactly those uh, details. So I would say it's really a huge jump, uh, uh, big addition. What we had in the past, it really digs deeper in in the in the uh, SAP uh, specific parts and pulling those in. very useful. Uh, uh, um, uh, management and monitoring information from every day for every day to day work of mm. the SAP basis admins, right? Um, and if you skip to the, for example, the next um, on the next blog, it's also interesting. A uh, colleague of mine, Ross, so he wrote about basically the blog is about uh, okay tendency to migrate to zones. And if you have a pacemaker cluster with uh, SUSE, SUSE would use um, as an SBD devices, a nice SCSI target VMs, typically they would have a three. So what he described is basically to con to deploy a new three iSCSI uh, devices and reconfigure the existing cluster to use that new iSCSI, which are basically deployed on the three VMs. Uh, this is a one approach. Another approach will be to move the VMs itself to the zones. OK, but he gave here at least uh, an example and a showcase how to actually uh, rec reconfig those uh, stuff with the new VMs, so to say, mm -hmm. which are in the zones. Yeah, very useful stuff, I would say, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Great, yeah. OK, um, then um, one Switching again from from the infrastructure to to um, the data. Um, Close to your heart. Yes, but but actually Bartosz <laughs> um, has done a lot of area, uh, a lot of um, work here in the um, OData extraction, how you can use OData um, to retrieve, to connect to an SAP system. And then once you have the data, what you can um, do with this. Um, again, we, we had published or Bartosz had published just this before, but now it's published again here on the on the on the, on the synapse um, blog post and um, remember this is an eight part series we are now at part two again so um, if you have not seen it before it's 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 really a beautiful um, blog post series that that uh, guides you through the steps of how you can actually use um, O data um, to retrieve data from the SAP system and then to um, in the end really work with this data um, yeah, with with Azure Sentinel, with um, Power BI in the end, and and, and so on, uh, in a in a really nice way. So um, this whole series from Bartosz is, is highly um, recommended, and I think it's a uh, yeah, it's 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 a good second part here, um, and and we'll obviously follow all the other parts as well. Good. Then we come to last one thing, and and uh, that is on December first. So in a little. Uh, almost a week. Um, I have the pleasure to um, join a webinar together with um, colleagues from Neptune Software, and we're talking about the Power Platform and how you can use um, the Power Platform to connect to an SAP system and, and uh, work with SAP data there. It's, uh, I think, an interesting approach. Um, so obviously, as, and pow the Power Platform has some out-of-the-box SAP connectors, um, but um, with this approach from, from Neptune, we have an, another way how to connect to, to SAP data um, using REST protocols um, and then connecting to BAPI's LV reports and, and stuff like that. So um, if you're interested in this, um, I think this is definitely uh, <laughs> worth checking out. Um, I, I hope we'll have some some cool demos and some some really nice um, yeah, uh, examples of how you can use the Power Platform with your SAP system. Good. So with this, um, I think that was the the, the news from um, from this week. And um, with that, I think we can um, hand over to Trond. Um, maybe Trond, um, you can quickly introduce yourself, and then I'm looking forward to the content that you have uh, brought with you. Ah, you're still on mute. Mute. Hold on. No. Yes. Perfect. 
Ah, on mute again. <laughs> no. Now it should be OK. Great. Yes, perfect. I have an issue with Teams from time to time. <laughs> OK, so my name is Tron. I'm a cloud solutions architect for SAP on Azure, and I've been with Microsoft for uh, it's coming up to three years now, actually. Time is flying. And uh, when I started out in my job, I had a lot of knowledge about uh, integration and development technologies in the SAP world, but not really that much when it came to pure, what you would say, SAP basis related stuff or architecture, such as how to size SAP servers and, uh, and, and disk layout and storage and all that. So I was thrown into a few projects, of course, with customers who wanted to migrate their SAP workloads to Azure. And uh, for the sake of my own sanity, more or less, I started writing a document uh, to sort of collect all of these experiences, both from my own projects and from projects that my colleagues have been doing. And this has ended up in a document, which is now uh, 20 odd pages, where I tried to basically summarize the principles for uh, sizing SAP on Azure. Mm -hmm. Cool. cool. So uh, maybe I should uh, try and share my screen and uh, give a little look at this document, the uh, the basic layout of it. Mm -hmm. Just hang on. Right. It's coming so up. this document is basically focused on, as I said, uh, sizing SAP workloads on Azure because what we know when 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 companies come to us and and uh, and we start these discussions the initial discussions of uh, moving their workloads to azure a lot of them have let's say uh, predefined specs based on whatever sizing they have on premise uh, they have maybe had their systems for a number of years they have maybe done some tuning and they have a, a lot of experience in running these uh, these on premise systems but uh, the issue is that a lot of them tend to bring that experience across to Azure as well. Okay, so so we have a system this and this size, so and so many application servers, this and this DB server size, and so on and so forth. And we would like to have the same thing on Azure. Uh, as you know, Azure has a very nice feature. It permits you to start with one configuration and then size up and down based on how your system performs. We have a lot more flexibility. And for that purpose, uh, we have a lot of, uh, let's say, ground rules that you can follow uh, when you move your workloads to Azure. First of all, uh, you should look at things like your early watch reports, your HANA mm -hmm. sizing reports, and so on and so forth. And I've tried to capture all of that uh, in the specific sections of this document. So if we look at how this document is structured, it's basically divided into two main uh, sections. Let's see if I can try to get this right. The sizing of non-HANA systems and the sizing of HANA systems, because the sizing of HANA systems is quite distinct from the sizing of uh, systems running on non-HANA databases. Uh, Obviously, when you size uh, a HANA system, you will make uh, you will focus a lot on the memory. HANA is an in-memory database. Your DB servers will naturally uh, usually be quite a bit larger than the servers you need to run any other database, right? Mm -hmm. So, if we start with the non-HANA SAP systems, uh, I talk about some general recommendations for the sizing of applications and ASCS servers. I talk about how to use the concept of SAPS, which is uh, a well-known uh, uh, a well-known acronym in the SAP world. This is the performance, uh, let's say, uh, uh, performance counter for how to measure an SAP system. I talk a little bit about the recommendations for disk sizing, and we also have a wealth of documentation internally at Microsoft and, of course, also uh, externally for how to size uh, VMs and uh, uh, and also disk layouts for a specific database brand. So if you size uh, a DB2 system, it won't necessarily be the same size as a, as a similarly sized database for uh, Sybase or ASE, right? Mm -hmm. So in the document, I also try to cater for that and I've uh, provided quite a bit of links to internal and external documentation that that should help uh, people to do the right sizing in those cases. And uh, I, I, I give a few examples as well. I have some examples with some screenshots showing how to use the uh, 
uh, uh, the uh, SCP early watch reports or the HANA sizing reports to, to try to figure out whether your existing system might be oversized, whether it could make sense to look at a, a, smaller, uh, a smaller virtual machine or a set of virtual machines when going to Azure. And then for the HANA systems, of course, as I said, the main point uh, of a HANA system is, of course, uh, the memory that uh, is needed to run your database. So I give some, again, some general recommendations for application servers, and uh, and then we move to the main point, which is the database server sizing. Uh, some recommendations for disk sizing, a few examples of sizing on HANA, and also one section here at the bottom with uh, sizing with Azure NetApp files, because that's also a storage technology that we see some customers are becoming increasingly more interested in, specifically with larger systems, uh, specifically than uh, uh, BW system, which uh, which could be very large. Uh, I also have some, but when it, when it comes to ANF, there are some specific things to take into account, like the uh, requirements on the HANA side for things like throughput and IOPS. So the calculations can get quite tricky if you if you want to do the sizing properly with Azure NetApp files. But uh, I also have a couple of examples on how to do that. And finally, at the end of this document, I have a couple of pages with uh, lots of links, both to internal Microsoft documentation, uh, specific SAP notes and uh, and also some external blogs and articles and documentation. So what I intended this document to be is basically a sort of a one-stop resource for anyone who is uh, fairly new to sizing SAP on Azure, but uh, hopefully it contains a few interesting tips and tricks for uh, people who are uh, yeah who have been in this game for for uh, for a bit of time as well. And one thing I really want to mention is the section I have in this document with the, uh, let's say, tips. Uh, I was going to say tricks and tips for uh, getting the most bang for your bucks on Azure. Things like uh, uh, using uh, using uh, the uh, memory uh, optimized machines in the E series for non-productive environments where you don't really need to have a bigger M series to run your system. Things like using pay-as-you-go systems uh, for systems that you can shut down when they're not uh, when they're not in use, uh, and uh, and of course uh, uh, also things like uh, uh, yeah, basically uh, if you implement the disaster recovery system, you might want to run your QA system on that same VM in order to. Uh, make use of that virtual machine in case you you want the full size DR system. You can also work with things like uh, reduced disaster recovery system, uh, and and I try to explain a little bit about the pros and cons of of these approaches as well, and and uh, and document let's say the pitfalls or things you should be aware of when you when you set up your system layout on Azure. I, I think what I really liked about this this document is, um, uh, let's say if I, 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 I'm a customer, I have my SAP system running on premise. I, I know the early watch report. Obviously, this is something that I um, regularly get and, and evaluate, but um, my on-premise environment doesn't, doesn't give me the, the right um, flexibility to, to adjust uh, on these things. And now I have an opportunity. I, I move my SAP systems to Azure. And yeah, obviously I, I can use the um, early watch report to get started. But then, as you said, uh, you you have focused also a lot of things on these tips and tricks, as you call them. And what I what I very much like there is also that you outlined. Look, here's an opportunity where you could um, make the size really small, basically, which obviously impacts the cost. But yep. you also clearly outline. Look, be very conscious about this. I mean, yes, it, it reduces the cost in this specific scenario, but there, there might be some some um, constraints with this, and and that's where I think you you be you are very very transparent, which also helps me as a customer then to to better understand um, why is maybe one price um, cheaper than 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 the other, and I can understand what what are the difference um, in the in the architecture that you're proposing there. So I think yep. thought. That was something that I really loved when when I read through the document. Mm -hmm. Especially, I already mentioned the example of disaster recovery. We have customers who who want disaster recovery, so they want to have a specific VM set up in a in a in a in a second region, uh, and then you do HANA uh, system replication between uh, between these these two systems. Uh, but a lot of customers are 
reluctant to paying full price for that VM, right? So, mm -hmm. so what I mentioned is things that, okay, you can have a reduced, I mean, there are different uh, var uh, varieties of setting up the HANA system replication. Uh, and if you set it up in a way so that you can have a reduced uh, VM in the DR region, fine, you can reduce your cost. We have customers doing that, customers who are very cost conscious, but you have to be aware of the fact that if there ever is a DR failover, uh, mm -hmm. There might be a lot of customers flocking to that specific region. So in a sense, uh, you have to be aware of the fact that if you need to scale up that VM in order to move your productive workload into that region, that could be, uh, let's say, uh, something you have to keep in mind. So yes, we have a uh, we have a lot of ways to, I mean, the nice thing, is, uh, thing about Azure is that it gives you all of the building blocks you need. You just have to consider in which way you want to use them you have to mm -hmm. you basically build your infrastructure and you have to know what you're doing so that's that's basically what i'm trying to do with this document to tell people that okay uh, you can do this in one way or the other way but uh, you have to be aware of the consequences mm. yeah for me is always i mean when you talk about the size and going to the cloud somehow what i hear often it's those uh, many customers or partners they would just copy the, the pays the on-premise mentality to the cloud. Yep. And that would mean basically on the on-premise, of course, you would always go for a, a, a kind of um, oversize because mm -hmm. you want to be a sure that uh, you can uh, meet the peaks, peak loads, so if we talk about the prod system, but those peak loads, of course, that happening maybe once in a quarter or something like this. Yep. And you want also to predict the potential future growth for the next four or five years, then you also buy a bigger machine, which is, but then when, when you draw the line, they are staying unused most of the time. So you overpaid in advance, uh, which Absolutely. is not the case. So I saw you already, I mean, for me, it was in interesting that aspect when you try to, when you're basically addressing like those example of how you can use the uh, elasticity of the cloud to meet. So DR is the one, one good example, for example, but you also mentioned, okay, DB, is, uh, okay, AS is a small instance. DB typically you won't change. People don't want it. And I think sometimes also related to the licenses, for example, that's become a tricky if you are bound to the CPU course, you know. Um, but did you, um, for example, would be interesting all for the app servers, you know, they are typically could go uh, um, uh, up and down, you know, depending on the load. They are kind of very much in, in burn, you know, so. Um, the, these things could be also kind of scaled as for need. Yeah, the, the, the nice thing about the nice thing about these things is that you can, of course, scale up and down the app servers. You can also add app servers to an SAP exactly, system. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think there is a blog somewhere that actually tells you how to how to automate that as well. I mean, you could uh, sure. you could actually create uh, workflows with things like Logic Apps and uh, and use that to automatically scale up your SAP system by adding app servers for peak periods and so on and so forth. But it, it's definitely true what you're saying that a lot of customers are coming to the cloud with this on-premise mindset and they want to have exactly the same as they have on-premise and they want to overbuild the system uh, just in order to be sure that it can cater for the growth that they predict in the next three to five years or whatnot. And the, the, the nice thing is, of course, that you can start out by having an oversized system uh, and then after a few weeks or a couple of months of monitoring, you find out that, okay, my system is actually 50% oversized and then you can just scale it down. Right, exactly. And you end up with a system which is perfectly capable to do what you need it to do. And if you have then, uh, let's say, a year-end closing, which is a bit troublesome, then you can you can actually scale up. Uh, you have to pay for that extra capacity for a few days or a couple of weeks, but then you can scale back down again. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is also one of the recommendations that we have when, when customers run their SAP system, that it's not a um, one-time thing and then you revisit the installation after three years and see, but but it's really a constant thing. And I think um, Microsoft Digital or something like that, they they switched from a three-year cycle or something like that to a three-month cycle. So that really every three months they re-evaluate um, is our are our systems too big, too small? Do we need to do do something? Do we need to resize the virtual machines? So so this is an ongoing process. But I think um the, the, the beauty here in the document is it helps me to get started because if we go to a customer or if, if a customer is, is interested in, in migrating, they obviously want to have a, some kind of idea, how much will this cost me? 
and I mean, ideally, at the end, they they can um, optimize and resize it um, um, during the the operation. But um, with this, they they have a good starting point. They have a good um, idea of um, how the architecture would look like. What virtual machines do I need, and and so on. Yep. Uh, and I think I mean all of the all of the partners we work with are of course very seasoned when it comes to doing this sizing. But it it could be a good thing for a customer that considers starting out the project on Azure to 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 maybe use this document to get an initial uh, feel mm -hmm. for what the landscape on Azure could look like size wise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that I that I'm not completely dependent on some um, third party information, but I have already some some idea uh, how much Correct. this would cost or, or what yeah. is required. And for yeah. me, it's also sometimes, as you mentioned, Holger, ma many customers are extremely cost sensitive, and that's also an argument actually to move to the cloud, right? Which makes sense. On the other hand, when, I, when I'm uh, thinking about the DR scenario, you know what Tron was mentioning is like, uh, okay, you can put a smaller VM size, which would cut the cost of the infrastructure which you require for the DR. But however, even that, there is also that aspect of um, fast failover to the DR site. So if you just think about, okay, I have an HANA, right? And I downsize the HANA, okay, which is enough to replicate it, but on the disk, not in the memory. I can't put it in memory one-on-one -on -one because the VM is smaller. So basically, I would need to resize the VM, then uh, to you know to uh, fill the or um, uh, I mean uh, site one size. Then I need to load the data from the disk, which takes also time. Resize takes time, some time uh, loading. So basically, this is all kind of a bit prolonging the failover time, right? Um, so maybe this can be also a kind of one aspect to think how fast do I need to fill over how much is something to the DR side, how much something is critical. If for business says, yes, this is a critical, then OK, that could justify even having a bigger sizes, for example, for the HANA in order to uh, speed up the DR failover as an example, right? And now since you're at this this last, th that's um, the uh, the the tips and tricks section, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. of the document, and exactly, I think exactly what what I really like there is this um, that you're saying. Look, this is the, these are some ideas about the best possible offer, but you you immediately say, but you should we should make this transparent to the customer that um, th this might be the, the the cheapest offering, and um, and it runs perfectly fine, but um, th there there are some um, some some things that customers need to to consider when when going this route. Yeah, absolutely. And this is very important because what we oversee or what we very often see when we have the initial discussions with uh, with customers is that they are very cost conscious. Uh, and, and some customers actually come to Azure and say, OK, we, we just want it to be cheaper than what we have today, uh, yeah. which is not a general rule. If you want to have a system which is sized ex exactly the same, it, it might still be cheaper, but maybe not by the factor that the customer is expecting. So. This document really tries to tell you how you can how you can let, let's say economize on some features and, and some of these features i mean most of them doesn't even compromise the the general behavior of the system mm -hmm. i mean if you have a sandbox system which is uh, uh, up and running or, or used only a few hours a day why not turn it off overnight and, and save yeah. the cost of that vm yeah. turn it off during the weekend turn it off during the vacation periods i mean don't pay for something you don't use it's yeah. as simple as that yeah yeah, which also boils down to the use case type of the SAP one stuff is the prod system, which is run 24 by 7 typically, mm -hmm. right? And everything else is not 24 by 7 very often, right? So a huge potential to to do a saving. Um, I'm also interesting how you know you you also maybe you can tell a bit more. You were discussing about pay as you go versus uh, paying a, a reserve in instances. You also advising, OK, start, for example, start with a, a full pay as you go and then maybe later. So how, how is your experience there? You know, because wh where is the balance, so to say? Well, it, it really depends on how well you are 
doing the initial sizing to put it that way. If, if you know that your HANA system is going to need a four terabyte node, then by all means get that four terabyte node. But if you are unsure, and especially if you come from a non-HANA database into the HANA world, if you're doing a, a, a conversion to HANA, it can be, diffi can be difficult to, to, uh, to know beforehand how much your, let's say, DB2 uh, four terabyte database is, is going to uh, perform uh, when it when it moves to HANA. So I would almost say that uh, a general recommendation could be here to start off with the pay-as-you-go system. Okay, so you end up paying a little bit more for the first few weeks or maybe a couple of months, but it will give you the opportunity to look at the, uh, uh, the capacity requirements and the performance of that system. And if you find out rapidly that, okay, the, uh, the virtual machine we chose is, is actually twice as big as we need because we're not keeping all of that data in the HANA hot memory or whatnot, then fine, you can scale it down. And mm -hmm. Azure, of course, is, is I, would, I would say we are less rigid than other cloud providers because we always have a certain amount of flexibility even for reserved instances. So even if you buy capacity reservation, if you buy reserved capacity on on Azure, you can you can to some extent do a size down also with reserved instances. And I think it's 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 not only an either or. I mean, you can also have a mixture where you have a, a certain amount of reserved instances that covers um, some of the workload, and then you have um, other workload that is um, using pay as you go, where you have all, all the flexibility. Yeah. And even within the reverse, um, the um, uh, reserved instances, we also have flexibility, right? I think that is also something yes. very, very yes. important um, that um, you you buy basically um, uh, a certain um, type of, of virtual machine, but in this in this type or in this series, you can still be very flexible in how you assign um, your reserved instance credit, so to say. Yes, correct. Yeah. So, so I guess basically, Tron, you would also reflect here different layers of the SAP system and, and then think, OK, like database layer probably makes sense to go for the reserved instance because it's just we are talking a prod system, right? That running 24 by 7, you don't change the size generally. Central services, I guess, as well, because they are small but still fixed, right? So I guess app server layer is again very flexible there. It goes up, uh, um, scale out or scale in or up, up doesn't matter. Probably on that layer, I, I would guess. What is your experience? Would that make sense to go for pay as you go, so to say, on the app layer? I uh, would, I would maybe more say that it makes sense to go uh, to to divide your systems into into uh, the different tiers. So you have production, you have QA, you have sandbox, you have development, and then you weigh those different tiers against each other. For a prod system, once you've reached, let's say, the optimal configuration, you probably want to stay with reserved instances for, for, for that system. You, you don't really want to, I mean, often you will not have the need to take away app servers or add new ones. And in any case, app servers, ASCS, usually run on very small-ish yeah. VMs like uh, four, uh, four CPU, eight CPU. They're not that costly in the big picture. I mean, especially when running on HANA, it's, it's going to be the big HANA machines that are going to cost you the most. They will normally cater for at least 90% of your total uh, infrastructure costs on, on uh, Azure. So for a prod system, make sure that prod system is up and running 24-7. Uh, and once you have sized it properly, uh, go to reserved instance because that gives you the, the uh, biggest price reduction, of course, compared to pay-as-you-go. But for other systems like stress and volume testing, for instance, maybe you have dedicated test systems that you run, let's say, once a month because you are doing a monthly import all job or whatnot, or maybe you need something to uh, uh, to to increase capacity during the uh, testing of the year and closing jobs or whatnot. Those systems, you could easily go with pay as you go because uh, you may not need them for longer periods at a time. And, and specifically, like I mentioned, sandbox systems. Sandbox systems are, in my experience, not really something which is needed 24-7, unless, of course, if you have global development teams that are working around the clock. But then again, it would make sense to look at the peaks in utilization and try to identify usage patterns and for the systems that are not crucial to uh, to to running your, your, your day-to-day business, 
find out when you can take them offline, when you can scale them down, when you can use this flexibility that we give you on Azure. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I will jump here. We already have this start stop with Power App as well, you know, for the collaborative work between mm -hmm. the different users, right? So <laughs> it can be used for the non prod stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, you, you, we, we also had this episode, right, where we talked about your run books um, that are now implemented in a or accessible via Power App, and you can easily start and stop your SAP system. And there, and and actually, I mean, if I look at myself, I also have my own sandbox system that I'm using from time to time. But honestly, it's it's stopped most of the time, and I I, I use it a few times a month, and. When I use it, then I'll, I'll start it up. Uh, I'll do some some tests or, or some development, and then I'll shut it down again. And that's um, perfect for pay as you go because I I mean yes I do pay the storage, but storage is extremely um, cheap um, when when it comes to to just these 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 systems there. And then I I only pay the runtime when I when I actually the, so the compute when I actually use it so it's it's very very convenient for me. And with the managed disk, the the start stop automation will yeah. convert from premiums to standard, so you pay even less when the VMs are yes. stopped. Yeah, so that's also additional saving. A, yeah, I need to make sure that we highlight the episode again where we, yes. where we talk about. Yeah, it. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it fits. It yes. fits the story. Yeah. 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 Actually, Tron, when, when we look at that, there, there are a lot of different um, parameters there. And I, I I know, obviously, then finding or coming to the right solution, that is a fairly uh, complex process, I guess. So um, in order to get to this, uh, you you probably create Excel sheets and stuff like that to um, tweak the pricing, <laughs> tweak the virtual machines and stuff like that. So do you have something there? Yeah, we have something there, and uh, that's when I have to uh, share my second screen here because we we have had something here at Microsoft for actually a number of years now, uh, which we call the SAP on Azure uh, pricing calculator, uh, and it's 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 not to be confused with the uh, uh, web page, which is public and accessible to everyone, which uh, you can use in order to size uh, VMs and uh, uh, networking costs and uh, and storage and whatnot. This calculator is something which we are now planning to make. We're actually making it available to partners and customers. Uh, and it's a, it's a tool that works exactly like the internal calculator we've been using for a few years. It's in constant development and it's a, it's an excellent tool for uh, rapidly uh, coming up with the uh, cost of, uh, of an SAP landscape on Azure. So. Just to show you some of the features of this uh, of this calculator, uh, it, it has it has a lot of inbuilt functionality. So you can do things like uh, you can uh, compare regions. You can uh, uh, basically select the regions you want to deploy your SAP workloads in. Uh, you can set things like currency and contract length. And uh, the nice thing here is that one, you don't have to do anything manually here. I mean, each line in this Excel uh, relates to one specific. Uh, SAP server. So if I want to size, let's say, a four terabyte SAP system, all I have to do here is uh, click this load configurator button and I can then choose a predefined configuration. I scroll down to my four terabyte HANA node. OK, so let's go with, uh, with an MV2 series. And I click OK. And that basically gives me uh, the complete details for this machine. It's going to be an M128 MSV2. I have to do a couple of other things. I have to select an environment. Let's say that this is now going to be a prod system. And that basically gives me all the data for that machine. I have things like I can change the pricing model. I can uh, select what kind of utilization. So if here uh, I, I opt for pay as you go, I can see what the cost is going to be if I use it, let's say 20% of the time or or 30 or 100. I can select the Azure, uh, the, the operating system I'm going to use. So let's say we select uh, SUSE for, uh, for SAP support. Uh, I can uh, then 
look at the uh, characteristics of this machine, which comes automatically. This is a 128 CPU machine with uh, roughly four terabyte of memory. This is the SAPS number. This is interesting because this is a concept that most people working with SAP will be perfectly familiar with. And, and what this Excel calculator is doing now, it gives me also the suggested storage layout for this machine. So it tells me that, okay, for the OS, we need one disk of type P10, which is, as you can see, a 128 gigabyte disk. Uh, we're using a P6 disk for the executables, and then for the data and log and, and shared areas, we basically get the complete disk layout for this machine automatically filled in for this machine. Uh, the only thing I did was select the size of the system. Remember, a four terabytes HANA system. Mm -hmm. And I get all of these. OK, I can click the backup default button. Let me just do that. This is fun. This gives you uh, automatic uh, insertion of, uh, let's say, uh, general backup values. So it pre-fills these columns with the uh, daily backup retain frequency. Uh, weekly and monthly, I can change the storage type. Let's say this is a prod system, so I want to have uh, globally redundant storage. Fine, I'm doing that. And if we scroll all the way to the right, it gives me the price breakdown for this machine. So we can see, okay, the backup costs. This is one issue. It's uh, meant to be used for machines with uh, a dot as a decimal point, not a comma. So. OK, so this is the VM price. This is the storage price for this machine. And uh, at the right end here, we have the backup cost. And the interesting thing now is you have the price now in dollars for this VM with the storage layout. Uh, let's see. Let's say you want to swap regions. You want to put this machine in, uh, let's say, uh, OK, let's, let's try France Central. OK, I'm going to do that. And this will be reflected right away with the price. So we can now see the difference in price. I think it's slightly more expensive in the French region compared to Europe North. So this tool actually allows you to build up an SAP landscape rapidly. You can select your environment. Uh, you basically select the size of your machines. You can add app servers. You can add ASCS. If we, uh, if we load, let's say we need a couple of app servers so I can go to the general VMs. I can select, uh, uh, okay, we have a selection of app servers. I will go with the D8V3. I will put two of them and I will add them. And now I have my app servers. I will also select environment prod for these. And that at the end of that, you have actually here, if I click the ROM tab, I can see the total cost estimate for 12 months with the uh, infrastructure that I have selected. So I now have VMs, I have storage, I have backup. And you can also define phases for your project. So normally when you migrate an SAP system to Azure, you will start with the sandbox systems, followed by development, followed by QA, and, and finally prod. So I can set the dates here. And that's actually going now to impact the pricing, I can do stuff like this. That's okay, it says 2021, so we're probably a little bit behind it with this project. But now I have a project with uh, a first phase duration of three months, then I have uh, and phase two, which is three months, and a phase three, which is six months. And if I go back to the solution design tab, this is the prod system, right? So. What I have to do, what I can do with this one is to say that the prod system is going to be available only in the third phase. So I put it mm -hmm. in phase three instead of phase one. If it's a development system, it would of course be uh, available across all of these phases. But this is really nice because when you plan your project, you really want to see what the costs are going to be the total cost per phase of your project. So you get a very good outlook on what your total cost of ownership on Azure is going to be uh, based on the migration speed of your project, based on the system landscape you have. And you can, as I said, you can swap regions, you can swap currencies, you can set the contract length, and you can really play around with all of these parameters. And if you would, 
if you were to do that by going to the uh, uh, official Azure uh, site, you would have to do this for virtual machines. You would have to do it separately for the disks. You would have to incorporate network costs. You would have to calculate the backup costs, which uh, is, is probably not really uh, a very easy thing to do even. And you would have to do all of those things and you would have to put all of that together in your own tool, uh, probably a more or less complex Excel sheet, right? And, and at the end of that process, you would have something which was static. So if someone comes around and say, oh, let's move to a new region. Let's do a simulation yeah. for Switzerland, for instance. Oh, then you have to go back to the same website and you have to uh, extract all of the new information that you need for each and every little component. And we are using this tool with customer landscapes that are, let's say, 100 VMs or bigger. And clearly, you can do something very, very easy and, uh, and and yet very elaborate with this tool. You can swap regions, you can change regions, you can change environments. You can. You also have a configuration tab for. Uh, you have a settings tab here, which. Uh, lets you actually set the utilization percentage for each of your systems so if you if you want to have uh, a sandbox uh, landscape with 25 percent utilization you can put that you go back to your solution design and instead of reserve instance you select sandbox and pay as you go and that will automatically out of the box show you the price for uh, that 25% uh, utilization. So instead of the reserved instance price, you're now getting the price for uh, a pay-as-you-go system with 25% usage, which is now down to 6,040. And of course, if you have, let's say you have 20 machines in your sandbox landscape yeah. and you want to increase the utilization from 25 to 40, you just have to go to the settings page and do that, and all of that will be reflected in each and every line of this uh, uh, main tab on, on, on the Excel. So okay. it's, it's really it's really an elaborate tool, and uh, um, we, we, we've tested it out with a couple of selected partners and customers so far and had uh, quite nice feedback. It, it saves a lot of time and energy, and uh, it's really something that we're uh, looking forward to bringing to a larger uh, audience. Yeah, I'm just thinking we need to connect this to the back in SAP system to automatically reflect. On this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I have to mention is that this, this tool uh, does not uh, connect to any kind of uh, central database in order to pull out things like exchange rates or, or VM prices and so on. So we do regularly update this tool. I mean, uh, prices change in Azure on a regular basis, and the aim is to get uh, a new version of the calculator out there uh, as soon as possible after we have uh, uh, price changes. So that's, uh, but, but also a nice feature of this tool is that you can import any kind of previous configurations that you've done with it. So if you have, uh, if you have built up your 100 uh, line Excel, with your existing system landscape and there is a, a, a price change on Azure, you can just open the new version of the calculator and you can import the configuration you have in the old Excel and everything will be updated. Cool. Nice. So, I mean, what, what I, I have to admit, I haven't used the tool for, for quite some time, um, but in, in the early beginning already, I, I really liked, for example, here, um, typically when I come from on premises, I obviously have already an Excel sheet where all my, machines are listed, all my SAP systems are, are there, and mm. um, you can just start by um, copying or transferring the, the information that you have about your existing landscape here in the pricing calculator. And then yep. you can start playing around. Oh, how what, what does it change if I take a bigger virtual machine or a smaller one? Um, maybe I, I um, use three smaller application servers instead of um, two bigger ones or something like that. Absolutely. Or how does the backup reflect? And and something that I always um, uh, found interesting is this this um, the disk setup. Here, as you, as you saw, as, as you did, um, you just select the virtual machine and automatically the the recommended disk layout is suggested. Yep. So so Absolutely. that, that yep. you need a certain number of um, I don't know here P15s for um, for the the log files or something like that. Yes. And of or, course, or another thing. The, the subs values. Um, typically, I, I had my SAP node open and my virtual machine. I was looking, oh, what, what is um, this virtual machine? How many subs does it have? And, and here, 
all this information is automatically retrieved for me. So it simplifies the way how I um, get started. Yeah, or similar to this thing here. Um, uh, you, what was P30 again? And here it's all mm, listed. Yeah, so it, it's, yeah. it's very, very, very nice. convenient. This is a very cool feature. And, and, and this is not static. I mean, if you're, if you want to play around with this, okay, let's say that, okay, for this application server, I don't want to go with premium disk. I want standard SSD instead. So fine. Then I just change it to, to a standard SSD and that will be automatically reflected in the pricing, right? So, mm -hmm. so this is a starting point. It gives you the recommended configurations, yeah. but it, you really have complete liberty to do whatever you want here. Yeah, this is great just to have this transparency, you know, um, for the user, because that's the biggest challenge, you know, coming from the on-premises world, you know, you never know how much something will cost. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the, the next question is, um, <clears throat> if I'm a customer, if I'm a partner and I, I see this now, how can I get this? Yeah, we are planning to put this out into uh, into the open world uh, soon. I, I can't say you exactly when, but I would suggest that uh, anyone who is interested, whether you're a customer or, or, or a partner, get in touch with uh, with with me, and I will uh, I will try to provide you a copy of this one. And uh, very very soon there there, there will be uh, the opportunity for customers and partners to uh, to, to to download this uh, on one of our public sites. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll put your um, information from LinkedIn um, into the description and also on GitHub so that uh, yeah, customers, partners can reach out to you via, well, via LinkedIn. Put the 24 by 7 telephone number, you know. <laughs> no, I'll not do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put my mobile phone number out there. <laughs> yeah, perfect. I think that was a, a really nice uh, walkthrough to to help customers get started um, with uh, sizing their their landscape, um, reading some good recommendations, and then also being able to execute it on on uh, this end and really getting a nice overview. Of how much would my landscape actually cost and um, a tool to easily play around with um, yeah absolutely optimize costs i think the only thing we need here is a button to click in order to deploy this automatically on azure uh -huh. but maybe we'll get there in the future yeah. i mean now we have the bits and pieces in place right so we yep. have the automation deployment framework and let's see what comes next absolutely cool great um anything else if not, then we'll just wrap it up. So we will put the, the the document on GitHub. We'll um, put in um, the LinkedIn information about you in the um, in the show notes, and then hopefully a lot of customers and partners can benefit from from these tools. Looking forward to it. Okay. Then with this, thank you very much for for joining, Trond. It was a pleasure having you here. Um, and yeah, a pleasure being here soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.